We're here on a little rescue mission today. We've got a good friend of the family who's uh, been saving up some money to renovate her bathroom. Uh, unfortunately, we, she's not quite prepared to take on the whole thing today, but she desperately needs a new tub and tub surround. So we're here to help her out and we're going to show you all the little things that you need to know so you can do this project yourself as well. All right, so this is the project today. And you can see why we're here. This is extreme. And then, unfortunately, no matter how bad this looks, this is more common than you might think. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a, a demo and rebuild, new tub, new tub surround, how to waterproof it, how to do all the plumbing, and what kind of dollars it takes to do that, and what you can expect to pay a professional to do it for you. So before we tackle this project, one thing we have to do, rule number one, if you're touching any plumbing or plumbing fixture, turn off the water supply to the house. You might think, I've got a shut off valve, I'm safe but I've been in situations where we just move something and a water supply line in the wall burst under pressure because it wasn't installed properly. Never take a chance with your water supply. So in every home that I've been in except for one, which is very unique, the water shutoff valve is on the front wall of the house and it's right next to the sewer and all those pipes that are heading towards the street. So when you go down in the basement, a lot of times they're in a really awkward, tricky spot. Not a big surprise. So we just reach in, grab the valve, uh, crank it clockwise. So you turn it off. After that, we go and open a tap, drain the water out of the lines, and then we're always safe to do any plumbing without any risk of causing serious damage to the home. So rule number one, now that we have the water off, we have to drain all the lines in the house to drop that water level in the pipes, of the water supply, below the area where we're gonna have surprises. So on the way up here, we open up the kitchen faucet, hot and cold, and now we're just gonna open up these lines. You see none of the water's coming out, the air is rushing in, the water's all emptying out of the line. So now we're good to go. So when you're doing a demolition, it's not like on TV, uh, what you wanna do is you wanna uninstall in the reverse order of the installation. So you start with the finished trim kit. Most of these shower fixtures have got a little cap on the handle which hides the screw. Okay, so inside we have a little set screw. This holds the handle on. Now we have these rings here. Now given this is not the traditional style that you see in most homes nowadays, this dates back a little bit. This one's uh, seized on pretty good, but it's made of solid brass. So we're using the screwdriver to create a dent. And then change the angle a little bit. So we can drive that nut. <sighs> Bit of a workout there, Joe. It keeps you in shape. Eh? There we go. There's the ugly beast right there. So this is all compression fittings. Not even soldered on. So you will find that whenever you have a fixture that's attached outside the tile or inside the actual tub area, it'll be a compression fitting, some sort of a threaded system, whether it's on a hose or pipe to pipe like this is. If the the only part that's exposed is the handle. That means the valve itself is inside the wall. You're more likely to find something that's soldered in there. In that situation, all you do is take off the face plate or the trim kit, they call it. And then you can remove the rest of it later. All right. There we go. So this uh, house was built in 1983. And it's 2016 right now. So you can see the solid brass fixtures last a long, long time, which is why it's important when you're doing something that you're expecting to last a long time to invest money in good quality fixtures. Unfortunately, a lot of things available on the market today for low value are actually plastic with chrome coverings, not brass. So time to remove the waste and overflow. Of course, things back in the 80s, a lot of slot screws. Wow. 
Nothing wants to come off easy here. We broke the screw instead of removed it. Same effect. Now the reason we have to remove the waste and overflow is because this plumbing, if we just yank the tub out without disconnecting it, we're putting a lot of pressure on the drain system. And we might cause a break somewhere that's gonna increase the amount of work that we have to do. So, although it may seem like a lot of work now, why not just take a hammer to it like on TV? There's a good reason not to. Every drain has got a cross inside the drain. And it's designed so that you can put in, you know, uh, it's got threaded here, you can put in your, your stopper or plunger. But this is a tub removal system. And you can buy these at the hardware store. You basically put your screw through the hole and it gives you lots of torque. You can unthread it. Or, if you just got a couple of good sized screwdrivers, you can put them in, cross the bars, and you get the torque. And you can do it this way. Now, if it's old, you'll find that using two screwdrivers in a lot of cases is just going to create a problem for you because you'll end up breaking little metal bars. But this system here is really quick and effective. So now we're going to remove the shower head. Wow. This one here is siliconed on with the trim. Okay, hopefully. If we're lucky, we'll just be able to turn the arm. <clears throat> yep, we got that. If that doesn't work, because it's too seized, take a wrench. <laughs> and you can take the shower head fixture off. Okay. And then, you can put your long screwdriver in the hole and get the extra torque some labor. So the further you are away from it, the more power you have. And you just give it a nice turn like that. There we go. So now we have to take a look at this wall surround, how to remove it without creating excessive damage to the room that requires a lot of rework. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to attempt to remove the tile surround and then reinstall the new tile right to the point where the paint is finished. So in order to do this, what we want to do is we want to cut through the silicone right through the drywall paper so that when we're taking things apart, we don't cause the paper on the surface of the drywall to tear off and require a repair and repaint. If this was TV, I'd be pulling out my sledgehammer right now, but the reality is Ceramic tile or porcelain tile, when you break it, is incredibly dangerous. So the less demolition you do, the better. It's also easier to remove and easier to clean up. So what I like to do is just cut out all the silicone, cut right through to that paper. You want to leave the ceiling intact in this situation because we're doing an economical rebuild. The goal here is to make this bathroom functional and hopefully a lot cuter by the time we're done. So traditionally when you build a, a shower, the drywall on the back is five feet long. So they put the back wall on first, then they build the sides. So when you're removing it, if you want to take it off in large pieces, you have to take the sides first and then take the back. Now, in order to do this without destroying this wall so we can tile up to it, we want to take the tile off the drywall the first row. And then we're going to cut through the wallboard and take the remainder. So this might require a little bit of finesse and a little bit of luck. So now we see evidence of how this was built. This is very traditional. It's according to the building code here in the province of Ontario. It's just drywall right through the whole shower. This is the residue of a glue. This is not a cement. And there's nothing in here that's waterproof. So any of the water that goes through the grout, which is porous, will be drawn in through the glue into this drywall. And this is why it starts molding wherever you get water pouring down the wall over time. This wall here is actually quite soft, but we do have wood in behind here. 
So this would be a good place for us to cut it. And then I can hopefully be able to save the rest of this. Now this is a little bit more exciting for all of you people who are big fans of TV. What we're gonna do is we're gonna smash a hole in the tile right through the wall, carry that all the way over to here. And we're gonna cut the wall board with a knife and remove this whole panel as one piece. So just jiggling. Remember, we're not taking off all something that's really strong. The drywall is only attached with screws or nails. So if you jiggle the wall, it'll pull the head through the back material. And then it'll open like a door. A little bit of downward pressure. Break that seal in the corner. There's your piece. So taking a look at the, the condition of this wall board here, it's not very good. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a cut line right where the old tile line was after we've done the demolition. And then we'll place a new wall board right up to this point. We'll also bring our waterproofing material up past the tub, and that'll guarantee that we won't get any mold down there in the future. Panel number two. So this is a little disappointing. This home was built with a very thin plastic. 1980s, they had Super 6, which is the current standard of plastic, but it wasn't part of the code. So this is actually a quite thin vapor barrier, and it's taken on a little bit of damage. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace this with a new vapor barrier, use a tuck tape and tie it in later. Now, really important, I should mention this, wear a pair of gloves that aren't gonna get cut open by the shards of ceramic tile or porcelain. This stuff here doesn't look like much because it breaks so easily, but when it runs across your skin, it'll cut you right clear to the bone. You won't even feel it until it's too late. And again, just a little jiggle. Opens like a door. Straight out to the garbage. What you see on the back of the plastic here, all this black, it's actually surface mold on the plastic evidence of the water damage. We save this panel. Let's take a look at what's behind your shower. It's not that bad, but the problem is, is it's right where the silicone joint is. And so every couple of months, you got to come along with the bleach and clean it up. You're not solving the problem. You're just removing, you know, the aesthetic issue. The real water damage is most likely going to be against this wall. Most people shower standing up against the water and the water runs right down into this corner. For now, we're gonna just remove this with a little jiggle. Keeping an eye on the ceiling because we don't want to peel the ceiling off. So I'll actually use some downward pressure here as I'm jiggling. So this might be better done by two people unless you're confident you can carry the approximately 60 or 70 pounds that I'm pulling off the wall here. One piece. Now you want to take a look right here. So interesting point here, the wall we removed from here was regular drywall. The wall from the back wall was a water resistant green board when it first came out. And that water resistant board is also the one that molded. So when you're doing this kind of renovation, keep in mind that just says something is water resistant, doesn't mean it's waterproof. And just because something's mold resistant doesn't mean it's mold proof. Just means you'll get the same ugly mess, just takes a little longer to get there. So I mentioned earlier that we're trying to do this project without affecting the painted surfaces of the house so we can minimize the overall damage. This is a metal corner bead. It goes on both sides of the corner. If we disturb this, we're doing mud work and paint work. And this project can't be done in a day and in a couple of hours. It would take a few days. So what we're doing is trying to remove the tile from this area so that we can cut the drywall an inch in and replace all of the bad board, anything that would have been sitting where water was sitting and gone moldy. 
We're just checking to see if that's plausible right now. So I'm feeling pretty comfortable about doing that. Just cutting this wall board right here. Now there's wood behind here, so I can't use a drywall saw. All I can do is just cut a few times until I know I'm through. So it's a traditional steel tub. It's installed just by gravity and it has a little metal clip that might be attached to the frame. So once the plumbing is disconnected, it comes out quite easily, as long as the walls are removed first. And in most cases when they install a tub, there is no drywall on the wall. So they have a, a 60, 60 and a half inch space in a 60 inch tub and they just slide it in, it's nice and simple. When we're doing this removal, because we have this corner over here and we have drywall on that wall there, what we're gonna try to do is roll the front up and then use the space in between the two by fours to jiggle it and wiggle it out. So this is a bit of a trick, but we're going to just give a little yank here and we don't wanna use our fingers for this. And we're going to use that there to roll it. The reason I'm using my hammer is because if I run into an issue like this one, I want to be able to set it down without the use of my hands. I'm going to have to maybe grab my cameraman here to give me a hand. So our tub is positioned in such a way with this really old style of faucet that we can't roll it out without causing major damage. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut back the water supply lines to the point where this is out of our way so we can lift the tub and roll it in the position that it's in. So what I have here is just a simple little pipe cutting tool. Copper is a very soft metal. You just tighten it on. And this is designed for really small spaces. So you don't have a whole lot of torque involved with this. The goal is just to get it to start spinning in circles and then after a couple of turns, you tighten the wheel, closing the diameter of the size of the pipe, tool, sorry, around the pipe, and it'll eventually cut right through. There we go. Done. The only real trick here is to make sure that the place where you're cutting the pipe doesn't have solder. You'll see here, like for instance, this little silver junk here. You know, when the plumbers are doing the soldering, it's not something that's gonna be visible, so they don't worry about the aesthetics. So if you have a bump like this, you're gonna start cutting on an angle, and you'll just be scoring all your pipe up and making a mess. There we go. Now, so now that we have that plumbing out of the way, we were able to lift the tub straight up. Now it's a pretty tight fit, so you gotta lift it level. And then we've rolled it forward and put the back of the tub on the two by four that used to be used for a brace. You'll notice this style of tub it was only held at the two x four and on the skirt directly on the ground. Steel is very strong, so of course when you fill it full of water and you jump in yourself, you're not gonna cause this thing to warp and break. But today's tubs are different. They've gotta be full of feet so they can transfer the weight. So it's a little different installation. Anyway, so now all we have to do is just lift this out. Because I have a 16 inch tub and a cavity here that's nice and big, I can just wiggle right out through the hole. What we're using to convert from copper to PEX is a shark bite connector. And this is what I was mentioning, it's like a Chinese finger puzzle. So the more pressure that's on, you know, instilled in this connection, the stronger it holds. Now we can generally just stick it right on the copper and shove it down and create the connection. But before you do, you want to take some sand cloth and clean your fiddle just to make sure that you don't have any burrs because, or, or any solder bumps like this. If you don't have a nice smooth connection, it will leak. You just set it on there, and then you just give it a push. Now that's locked in place. So 
I set it on, nice little twist and a push, locked in place. Now we're gonna take our pecs. We just want a rough measure up to where our pecs gonna go. We set that in there and we push. A bit of a twist, push. Now, both fittings are locked in place. They're not ever gonna come off. This is the claim, so today we're gonna find out if it's true. Basically what we have here is there's water intake that are designed for pecs. That reduces the amount of work that we have to do. And then there's two outs. One is for the tub and one goes to the shower head. It'll work with a physical diverter on the outside on the shower tub. Typical thing, you pull the trigger, stops the water, backs up, comes out the shower head. So this is kind of the system we're gonna use. So what we do is we use this wonderful plumber's paste and we put it on the threads. So in order to prep for our, our valve, we need Teflon tape. We're gonna do a few runs on the threads. So basically when it comes to plumbing, there's outside diameter and inside diameter of the pipes. And what we're dealing with is all half inch outside diameter. And the reason that's important is because when you go shopping, there'll be different sizes, half inch, three quarter. And so when you're dealing with most water supply, the copper pipes in the house are half inch. If it's all modern, it's still half inch, but it'll be in plastic piping. If you go to three quarter supply, traditionally that is a much larger volume of water. Sometimes people use that on the hot water going to their, their tub if they have a large volume they wanna fill. But traditionally, half inch is all you get. So we're gonna put this on here. We'll just hand tighten these and then we'll get the wrench out and then we'll finish that off. Now traditionally, it's not really necessary to use Teflon and plumber's paste. A lot of guys will just use, you know, just the Teflon or just the paste. But since it doesn't hurt, ugh, I use both. Unfortunately, there's a lot of products manufactured overseas nowadays. And then you find, in my experience doing warranty work, that a lot of times there's not really a problem with anything except for the fact that it's just not manufactured up to snuff. And nowadays, manufacturers don't seem to worry about quality control coming off the assembly line. They just replace something when it doesn't work. So with that in mind, a little overkill on making sure your compression fittings are nice and secure is probably a good idea because the net effect of something not working is a flood or destroying your ceiling, possibly your flooring, and all they're going to do is giving you a brand new free 79 cent fixture. <laughs> Who cares about the 79 cents? Traditionally on the back, it'll have markings. It'll have cold, hot, up and down, and that tells you which way to install it. Pretty simple. So you mark the center line on the wall, you place your fixture against your two by four, and use a couple of short screws, mount it. Now this product here is the Sherlock rings. Blah, 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 blah. They're half inch rings, which is half inch diameter, the outside of the pipe, which is the same as the copper as the plastic, these rings as we take that we just slide it over the pipe and we place them on our fixture. And we put this ring within a quarter inch of the end. That way we're clamping down on one of the rings on the brass, okay? We want to have pressure in between these rings and that's where you get your fit. So we just simply push this on, crimp them together. This takes a little bit of force. Make sure you close the tool entirely. And then from there, all we do is we cut back our water supply where we want it. Put on the other rings, slide them over the top. Take our elbow. Ah, 
as you can see, the advantages to all of this are really quite obvious. It's rather quick. And when I'm done crimping this together, we're finished with the water supply and we can test it right away. So the tools that we're using here don't require a whole lot of skill. Just a couple of simple crimps. The average homeowner can do this without any difficulty. A cutting tool for the pipe, a decent ability to measure, and you've got modern plumbing. The downside is, is you have to rely on your ability to crimp this to the exact depth that it holds the water pressure back and not too close, not too far away that you get a proper seal. And by the looks of it, there is room for manufacturer defect that the, if the crimp ring doesn't grab properly, it could break loose. So we'll have to wait until we do a water test to find out if it all holds together. 14, 7, 8. Mark my center. The next step here is to install our tub spout. And it operates just the same concept as the other. We want to just take our packs, measure the depth of it, take our PEX cutting tool, turn as you cut so you don't crush the pipe. Put your ring on each end first. Oh. Slide one on. Now for the shower head extension, we're going to put the ring on, we're going to attach what we call a drop ear. I don't know the story behind why it's called a drop ear. I'm sure it's fascinating. <laughs> it is definitely a, it's basically just a, a threaded brass fixture with built-in mounting ports here to put the screws in. Set up the height that we want, measure here with our eyes. Cut the tube, put on the ring, stick it on there, adjust for our quarter inch gap here, crimp, 14 and 7 eighths. So as you can see, we have a brand new shower valve with a tub spout and a shower head spout. All plastic pipes, crimp rings, brass fittings, shark bite connection. And this has enabled us to convert from an old system to a brand new system without the use of any torch or soldering or any special skills. No need to hire a licensed plumber. And we're good to go. The advantage of this system is that it's safe. It holds the water back, and anybody can do this. So in the end, I give Shark, Shark Bite an A plus for home users. The only downside is the cost. Um, if you're gonna use this on a regular basis, you might wanna learn how to do traditional plumbing with a torch. But if you're doing a home renovation or a simple upgrade, the $10 of fitting is worth the money because $10, $20, and I can switch over to plastic plumbing, and I don't need to hire a plumber. I did it in about 20 minutes, fantastic. So, let's just take a quick look at some of the finer points of the 1980s construction technique. <laughs> we have a standard subfloor, chipboard, tongue groove. That's normal. Um, these are exterior walls. Looks like two by six, so you probably have an R20 insulation. You can see the wonderful job the vapor barrier is doing here. Um, basically, this is just nailed over top of the framing for the tub support. But here's the plastic. We didn't cut it. This is installed like this. Just junk all the way around. There's no seal, there's no acoustic seal, there's no stapling, just hung. 
Not much moisture barrier going on at all, which is why you can see how much air movement there is while the insulation is going gray. That's not mold, that's just because there's dirt and there's air pulling the dirt around. So, whenever you see that, we're gonna to wanna to get rid of all that. This is garbage. It's got mold spores on the plastic surface now. All this insulation around the piping is just designed to keep the noise down when the tub is draining. That's all that is. Um, sometimes you'd even see people take the time to insulate around the tub before they install it. You know, if you have access to the cavities, that's nice because steel would lose the heat really quick, but in this case, that wasn't there. <laughs> so we're installing our vapor barrier here. The trick with this is you want to cut the old one out because if you have two full lengths of plastic together, you'll cause condensation in between. And condensation is never a good thing. Anytime water pools, it'll drip and want to find a way to get out. So now we're going to join the old and the new. Sealing up all the little nicks and scratches from the knife during demolition. Just nothing wrong with that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to prep for our new tub. This is the old waste overflow system. Oh, sorry. This is the old waste and overflow system. Um, it was designed for the tub that was here before. I believe it was about a 16 inch tub. Yeah, and it, there you go. And it's at about 13 inches high. The new tub is a 20 inch tub. And so our overflow is definitely going to be in a different location. And I don't want to have to reuse a plastic waste. It is a threaded connection, and we rely on that threaded connection for our compression. So since it's been used, we're going to cut it out and install a new one, and we're going to get rid of both of them. Now I have this fabulous little tool here from Rigid. It has a little spine on it, and it cuts ABS pipe real easy. You just lay it on, spin it around, and then you're good as done. Like most plumbing, the secret to good plumbing, of course. Yes, you guessed it, sandpaper. We want to always scratch and score, whether it's copper, whether it's brass, whether it's ABS, PVC. You always want to rough up your surface because everything we're doing involves adhesives or a torch or solder. And so all of these things require a clean, scratched up surface so that everything has something to bond to. Before we can prep, and install our waste overflow, we need to take our measurements off our tub. Every manufacturer is just a little bit different where the center line on the drain is, how far off the wall it's going to be. So while I still have it in the box, I'm gonna stick my measuring tape through the hole towards the box, and I'll mark my center line at eight and a half inches. Okay, so when I'm doing my plumbing upstairs, I mark that off at eight and a half inches. It has a little bit of play to it, so we won't have any difficulty in installing it. This here is our tub. This is a Maryland tub. It's a fabulous quality. They have a reinforced skirt with plywood sprayed on fiberglass, five feet. Reinforced bars going to the skirt for transferring the load right onto the skirt. Uh, I haven't found a more economical quality tub on the market. This is why I'm recommending Maryland. These are all the components of our waste overflow system. Uh, we picked this one, it's an ABS system, so you have to do the measuring and get all the heights just right. There are other alternatives out there that are a bit more flexible and adjustable. But uh, for the sake of our client here, we're gonna keep our costs down and just make sure we measure correctly. This is a really nice cover plate as well. Uh, it has a nice sleek look. It doesn't look like a traditional waste overflow. So anyway, we have an 18, sorry, an eight and a half off the wall mark. So what we're gonna do is mark this. That's my center line. So I'm gonna hold this roughly in the center. And you can see that after I install, I have a little bit of flexibility. Not so much front and back, but left and right. 
So we have to get this line pretty much dead on. So just like the plumbing pipes, we're gonna scratch up the inside of our fittings. Make sure that everything is nicely scratched up. We got our ABS glue here. Make it a good run. Stick that on and give it a bit of a turn. Okay. Now what we're doing here is we're using the existing P-trap and the existing T to save ourselves a little bit of time and headache. Replacing the old tub with a similar size so we didn't have to risk the uh, potential problems of running into where there might have been a joist right on the, the line that we're working on. Okay, so my eight and a half center means that I need a piece of pipe. Whoop. That is three quarters. These pipe cutters are awesome. They come one and a half inch, two inch, three inch. You just stick it on and go. I must have cut two, maybe 250 fittings already and I haven't had to change the blade. And we're gonna wait to put the waste overflow, the overflow neck on, because we wanna get the tub in place first and then make sure that we can get that to the perfect location. You can see that the way that this works is, when this is in position, there's not a whole lot of move, room here to make a mistake. So you put your gasket over top of it, and then the hole in the tub is actually quite large. So you can only be up or down maybe one eighth of an inch before you run the risk of leaks. So it's gotta be exact. So we're gonna wait till the tub's in place and level, and then we'll determine exactly where we set this. We can reach in behind and do that plumbing after the fact. So we won the battle and got the tub back in position. <laughs> Gave us a little bit of a fight. That's all right. So now we're just taking our brand new waste here. And we're gonna throw a little bit of plumber's putty on there. Now this plumber's putty is awesome because it'll stay as a waterproof seal forever. This stuff doesn't dry out. It's better than silicone because a lot of guys revert to silicone nowadays, but silicone in standing water will lose grip whatever surface it's on. So before we connect this, we want to remove protective plastic from around where the drain hole is. Because if we put this on with this little bit of plastic here, it seems harmless enough that the water will end up working its way between the layers. And we'll go underneath and it'll start a leak. And then one day you'll just have a really bad drip come through your ceiling. We're going to put this in, tub tool, and then just tighten this up. What we're going to do right now is we're going to dry fit the new overflow. So we've installed it in the tub temporarily. We have our plumbing in the back. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this off, put the fitting on without the glue, and install it and make sure that we have enough nice dry fit. Then we're not too big or too small. So we're gonna cut the back piece here first. I'm using my trusty cut and drywall square. This is simple. All you're doing is cutting the paper on the outside. So now that our tub is in, it's time to close up the walls. This is what we call a, our substrate. It's the material that goes behind the tile. contrary to what's taught on TV nowadays. Everybody's seen the green board, the blue board. Well, we're gonna be using a superior quality waterproofing system, which is going to prevent any of this board from ever getting wet. So it doesn't make any sense to invest it's a whole lot of money in something that's going behind our security system. So we got our wall board cut for the side, and we're gonna make the holes for the, our shower fixture and our tub spout. Now there are other ways to do this. I have a Rota zip tool, which is a drywall cutting tool, spiral saw, just zip this out no problem. You could also use a hole saw kit. But 
for the purpose of what we're doing here today, we're just demonstrating some of the basic hand tools you can get away with. If you wanted to use a cement backboard, you could. But that's really difficult to work with if you don't have the right saw blades and tools. So, We've installed this tub flush to this wall. Now these tubs, they come with an integrated tile flange. The Maryland tile flange is pretty thick. So uh, if we try to split the difference, we'll end up with our wall board coming down on top of it and not quite covering it. And then the tile will come down and then have to cover that way. It looks ugly. So what I do is I like to go flush to the wall. And if I'm gonna have a hole here, I can actually get strapping right in behind here. So the purpose of adding the build out is to bring the finished wall over top of the tile flange so that my new tile will go straight down onto the interior of the tub without having any ugly curves or bends in order to make that adjustment. This is a 33 and a half, that's fine, ugly. Because we're building this out, the new drywall won't meet up with the old one. So I picked up a piece of uh, metal J trim molding. You'll find that in the trim section for drywall where you get your outside corners and inside corners, U-channel, that sort of thing. So this one actually wraps the drywall on three sides. And by doing that, it'll give me a natural end to my tile. And I can actually just cock that with the old drywall and then finish paint right on top of that metal. So there's no mud work or anything like that to be done. The trick here is I have to cut this one piece of drywall out of one piece, no, no joints attach that J trim, and then install it all as one piece. So the measurements have got to be pretty exact this time. 33. There's our components. So we're just squeezing it on once we get this thing started. You can see it's a pretty snug fit. There we go, there's our wall panel. We've ripped everything up. We've changed our water supply, we have a new faucet, we've got a brand new tub, we have waste and overflow connected. We have built out our wall, we have fixed our vapor barrier, we remediated any mold behind the wall, we have closed it all up with new drywall. Yes, and there's a gap here, I know, don't be so judgmental. Here's the issue, I want it tight at the ceiling. This is a bigger issue than here. When I put my waterproofing membrane on, I'm gonna fill this with cement and cover it over with a cloth, and it'll be rock art anyway, so it'll have no cause and effect. We have all of this done, now ready to tile. We're just going to, uh, whip up some of our cement. We're using the Curdy membrane from Schluter System. This particular membrane, I uh, highly recommend you take the course if you're gonna do it professionally. If you're doing it in your own home, uh, make sure you get the right products. Not every store sell the products and the cements you need to get the job done properly. Uh, my supplier has a product that's a non-modified cement, which means the longer it stays wet, the better it is. It also means it'll adhere to the back and the front side of this plastic membrane that we're buying. It looks like a cloth, but it's made of plastic. So traditional modified cement will not adhere to it. 
This is the problems you run into with people mixing the wrong product. Anyway, I've taken the course. It was a lovely two days down in Toronto. I'm Schluter certified. I've got the card. I got the hat. I got the t-shirt. They give you a t-shirt, Max. Anyway, we're going to put this on the wall. We're going to waterproof our entire tub. And then it doesn't matter what you put on top of this. Any product that you put on top of your waterproof membrane, the tile in the grout is no longer a waterproof system. Now it's a water diversion system. And so it's just for aesthetics. Um, it can also be removed and reinstalled at a later date. So because of the nature of our environment here, we're just going to go with some simple white glazed tile and make it nice and clean. And hopefully in a few hours, we'll have this all closed up. Curdy membrane system requires a non-modified cement. Or in other words, cement. Uh, it's been like that for a few hundred years, ever since the Romans started building tubs. Um, bottom line, guys, is uh, the last 20, 25 years, they've modified cement, adding a latex polymer. And the idea is it makes cement act more like a glue. So in a lot of applications, that's handy. But depending on the products that you're working with and trying to combine together, adding that glue element can actually make it uh, counterproductive. It can make products not work. You can't bond certain things with glue to certain other things. But with cements, you can bond just about anything. So when in doubt, go with the old fashioned stuff. Because the old fashioned stuff will still work with any modern building material, but the new stuff may not. So for this job, we're using the uh, non-modified cement from MapPie. It's called Carabon. It's a tile mortar. Um, it's available at uh, different MapPie dealers in town. I like it because it's silky smooth when you apply it. Because we're mixing cement for a curdy membrane, it's important to have a little bit of experience here because traditionally you mix your cement, you let it sit for about 10 minutes, and then that's your cement. After you've let it sit and set up, you can't add water ever again. So you gotta get a little experience to know that something loose, where it's holding its own texture. This kind of cement right now is perfect. You wanna take a look at that. This kind of cement, where it's holding its own, it's not getting soupy. That's perfect for setting tile. But for a waterproofing membrane, it's too thick. We wanna have something that's a little bit wetter. Okay, that doesn't hold up any, any stiffness to it. The reason for that is uh, Schluter gives you a special trowel to apply their products, and the grooves are actually quite small. So you don't want it granulated at all. You want it really silky smooth. When you put it on, you want it to be nice and wet because it does take a little bit of time to apply it. And you don't want it to start drying too fast before you get it all covered. So now I'm applying cement to the wall. I have uh, marked my spot on the ceiling where I want my libel to go to. And because I'm in a hurry, my first goal is to just get a lot of smoke on the surface. And then I will trowel it out and get a better coverage in a second. Everybody has a different technique. It doesn't really matter. The idea is you're not trying to scrape it off the wall. You're just trying to leave a relatively consistent amount on the surface. I uh, have a fair amount of experience doing drywall work. So I usually hold the trowel like I'm applying drywall mud. You don't have to worry about it getting on your fixtures or the tub or your shoes. It'll all wash off. Okay, so this is the curtain membrane. I'm just using a continuous sheet. Now, I don't recommend this until you've had experience working with this product. We are adhering this membrane, which is waterproof and vapor proof, to our drywall to make a waterproof wall. It's a really quite simple concept. This membrane will not allow anything in the way of moisture to pass through it, which is why we are able to choose to go drywall on the substrate. And really all we're doing is applying this very similar to wallpaper. Okay, so we're gonna make sure our joint's nice and tight in the corner. So 
stretch it out, get rid of air bubbles. And then just work it down like that. I also realize if you look at the damage that was on the wall board of this original tile surround, it was just starting to mold from 1983. So this stuff here, the differences in the two systems is the old system didn't have a membrane. It was just drywall. And instead of using a cement, they used a glue. And that glue, although it's rated for showers, breaks down over time when it's wet. So, imperfect in every direction. Most showers are designed to last five to 10 years with really good performance. And then usually by the time they start breaking down and people find out that they're really ugly and they want to do something about it, it's 20 years later and everybody's happy because it's such a low cost investment. But the reality is nowadays people use their showers a lot more than they used to. So the same technology in a new shower, people are expecting different performance back in the 1980s. You had a shower, you got a shower, you got done, you got out. Nowadays, we're adding different fixtures, rain shower heads, spa tubs, jacuzzis, all these things that are designed to have people spend time in their bathroom and not be in a hurry to leave. It's like an oasis from all the kids and traffic and busyness of life. So the average shower nowadays is seeing five to six times as much water every year than they used to. The length of showers are going up. The uh, amount of people in the home taking showers is going up. Uh, bathing culture, switching over to shower culture is huge. So now they have to perform at a higher rate on a more regular basis. So if you double the amount of water going through a shower and it was failing, it won't just become twice as bad. Instead of having a 20 or 30 year shower, you'll have a five year bathroom. And that's what we're seeing. Brand new builds, three to five years in, covered in mold, leaking through the ceiling. Now, a couple little notes. The installation of this membrane, uh, traditionally speaking, is done by every panel and then they have an edge tape that they have a two inch overlap on. Uh, the edge tape is for convenience, not, necess it's not a necessity. If you're comfortable working with the membrane, you can just apply it like this. Um, these joints here, you can see it's a rough cut. It's a plastic, so the knife doesn't follow a straight line in a lot of cases. So you have a two inch overlay, okay? And this is where the waterproofing technology comes in. This membrane, done according to specs from the factory, comes with a manufacturer's warranty of 10 years. You won't have water getting behind your wall. That's better warranty than any other product on the market. Um, so now this is all done right to the ceiling. Just a quick warning. This product is available at uh, wholesalers and retailers around town. If you buy it at a retailer, make sure that they have the proper product available for sale to apply the product. Uh, I've seen on a couple of occasions where there's a major, major retailers that offer Schluter system that don't have the right cement to apply it. So if you ask for the cement that goes with it, the salesman may just offer you whatever's on the floor. Uh, it will fail and fall off the wall and it's dangerous. So just make sure that you've got a product that is a non-modified cement. Okay. Well, the client was looking at different renovation options. One of the ones that they were looking at was um, one of these companies that come in and they'll put an acrylic liner over top your current tub, which is kind of an interesting concept. And it's because what they do is they have a variety of different molds based on popular designs back in the day. And they'll actually come in and cover your existing tub, put a new drain cover in. Um, really, and then they just put up an acrylic tile surround, or not tile, sorry, they put up an acrylic tub surround, which is just like a plastic wall for most people, that's what they would think about. Now the interesting part about that is they're able to do that service in one day. Because they come in, they put on their strips of two-sided tape, and then they lay their new acrylic tub inside the old one, they press all that tape into place, they do their silicone work, they put on their wall surround, they do their silicone work, and they're done. Next morning you get up, you have a shower. The only problem is, is in order to get them in and out in one day, their basic quote is in the 4,000 and change range, which is amazing because they're basically putting in a new acrylic tub, which is what we've done here. 
and a new wall surround, which is what we've done here, made out of plastic, which is just our waterproof membrane. <laughs> and they're charging for time and materials what I would charge for three or four days worth of work. And the only benefit is that you get to have a shower the next day. Everything is old, your mold is still trapped in your walls, all your joints are silicone, it's gonna fail because you're in water. And give it a, another few months and you're right back to where you came from. Now, the benefit is, it's the only bathroom in the house and you've gotta have access to your shower, then it's quick. But if you can find a way to remediate, you know, get rid of that need for that quick turnaround, then you can have all brand new. You get to open the walls, make sure your plumbing is functioning properly. Make sure your insulation is still up to snuff after all these years. You know, the mice haven't eaten holes up and down through your walls. You get to make everything brand new again. And you'll have a bathroom that'll last another 30 years instead of another five. If you have to do that kind of a solution in a bathroom every five years, it's $1,000 a year to have a shower. That's expensive home maintenance. That's not a renovation, that's a maintenance program. So for tiling, there's a few things you need to know. One is you have to have an idea of where you're gonna start. So we usually start on the back wall and you can start in two ways. You can start with your tile in the center or you can start with your grout line on the center line. And those are really the only two options you have. And so what you do is you kind of just map it out, figure out are you gonna have a large piece or a little tiny sliver. If you have a sliver, then you change from center line on the tile to a center grout. And that will do the math to split to two large pieces of finishing instead of slivers. Now most tile is manufactured so that it finishes pretty much a full piece on the back of a standard tub. That's not the hard part. It's more along the sides of, you know, what kind of pattern you're gonna use, where you're gonna start and stop the wall. Here we have an overhang on a ceiling, so we're kind of stuck, that's our finish point. So we're not sure exactly what's gonna happen with that. So we'll just do a quick visual map here. And we're gonna end up with about a third of a tile left over. So I don't want that third of the tile on the outside. So when we do the side wall, we're gonna start on the edge and work our way in. And I'd rather leave the cuts all on the inside wall. That'll make it look pretty. Now we just applied this membrane 20 minutes ago. And because of the nature of the science of this non-modified cement, I'm allowed to tile right over top of a wet waterproof membrane wall. Now that is something that most products don't allow you to do. One of the reasons why I love using Schluter so much, because even though I'm only working here alone today, there's enough time to do the demolition, install a new tub, do new water supply, build a new shower, fur it out, waterproof it, and I still got enough daylight to tile it. If I was using any other system, it'd be a three-day job instead of a two-day job. These are just little tile spacers. I use them to keep all the lines consistent. I like, uh, I like things being consistent. So I'm going to use these even though I don't need to. This means I don't have to move my position to change my, my viewpoint all the time. So this is just a standard offset pattern. 50%, so half over. Nice and simple. It's very pleasing to the eye. And this is one of these situations where you're going to maybe be in a situation where you don't have the right tool for the job. Uh, if you go to your local hardware store, they will rent to you tile cutters of all different shapes and sizes, whether it be wet saws or just a scratch tool. If you're doing a small, simple tile like this, you can always buy your own tile cutter. They start at about $30 and generally speaking work pretty well. As long as you're not getting into some really hard stones or, or large porcelain that's uh, too big for the machine, then you should be okay. thing is these tiles are not very thick and they're ceramic they're not porcelain but I'm laying them in cement with an amazing adhesion so the strength of this wall is not going to be in the tile it's going to be in the fact that it's in cement
So we're all finished with the tile installation. It's been a long day, but worth it. Um, now all we have left to do tomorrow is we come back in, remove the spacers, clean out all the excess cement, wash down the tiles, grout, have lunch, uh, and put a fan on it for a couple of hours. Then we can come back in and do our finished silicone seal and screw on the finished trims. Um, I figured there's about another three or four hours work left to do. So day and a half, not bad, quick turnaround. The grouting a tile job is 50% application and 50% preparation. If you make sure that your lines are clean and you don't have cement sticking through from the installation process, it'll be a lot easier. A to prep and make sure it's clean and when you're done grouting you won't have as many touch-ups to do. When I'm grouting I always like to use a different color cement than I am grout. So in this case we're using a white grout so I use a gray cement. This way when I grout I can be sure that I have found all of the spots that have, need to be cleaned out and repaired before we finish and turn it over to the client. And the reason that's so important is because over time even if I used a white cement with a white grout there'll be different color whites and they'll discolor. And so six months down the road, they won't be happy with the look because they'll have different texture and different colors poking, poking, you know, different color poking through the wall. So this way, I can ensure the maximum amount of quality that I can give the client before I leave the house. Nothing worse in my business than getting called back to do something you should have done right the first time. Okay, mixing your grout now is a pretty simple process. Today, we're using unsanded grout. Um, this is a Mapi product with polymer. I love it. It's basic, it's simple, great uniform color, um, really easy to apply, easy to wash. Uh, it doesn't have any hardeners or any advanced technologies in it because we don't need it here. We have a waterproofing membrane, so we get to go with a, a grout that gives us the, the ability to shine and polish and form just the way we want to. So what we do is we've added a little bit of water in the bottom here. Unsanded grout is really try, kind of tricky very similar to like a pancake batter where if you get the wrong amount of moisture you put too much in too early you'll never recover you'll just end up using the whole bag of pancake flour mix right you start off with too much water when you mix you'll end up having uh, such a soupy mix you'll be sitting here for three or four hours waiting for it to evaporate So what I like to do is add a little bit of water at a time. And there we go, this will be perfect. We'll mix this for about two minutes. Make sure that uh, we don't have any dry spots. On low speed. Very important when mixing grout to use a low speed mixer, such as the one as I'm using here. At high speeds, you're gonna take all the different molecules and you're gonna be spinning it around so fast that they'll separate. And then let's say you're using a brown grout, for instance, you'll have red streaks. And when you put it on your floor, you'll have different color grout all over your floor. And you'll be sitting there wondering, why did that happen? It's because you mixed it too fast. All right, time to go and put it on the wall. So with a standard grout, you have about 20 minutes, half an hour to apply the grout and then within an hour or so to wash it all off. So that's plenty of time. We're not rushed. We get to take our time. So I'll just show you a bit of a technique. Generally speaking, the trick to grout, what you're doing with the unsanded, you can see how sloppy that is. It's still firm, but it's not very easy to manage. So I'd like to start at the bottom and then just lay it up the wall. Not worry about where it's falling all over the place. It's one of the reasons why we clean the tub is so that we can salvage any grout that's fallen on the floor or me inside the tub and it's still gonna be usable. Just get some coverage on the wall and start at the top and work our way down on an angle. Filling those crevices with the grout. Just pushing back and forth into the grout lines in different directions. So they fill it all up. 
and when I'm happy with the area on the wall, then I'm gonna remove it and put it next to me. Because the less grout that I leave on the wall, the less I have to wash off. When you're grouting the corners of the tile, you'll see that you're, most of these floats they have a square edge and they have a rounded edge. If I use the square edge in this corner, I end up cleaning all the grout out. We don't want that. So what you do is, this wall was in first, this one came in second. So on the wall that comes in second, you use the round edge, load up your grout, and just do it this way. That leaves a nice concave fill in the corner, and you're ready to go. So the next step to grouting is to polish the grout. Um, just take any basic grout sponge, you sell them at the hardware store, usually about two bucks a pop. And they're good for one application. Um, you can use it today. You might be able to use it to wash a wall the next day, but you don't ever want to mix grout. Sorry, you don't ever want to use a sponge for, for cleaning off grout more than one time. Because you want it as clean as possible. Now you can see it's starting to dry. It's getting a little pasty. So what I do is I'm just using a damp, damp sponge. Hardly any water coming out of here. And I'm just going to do circles. And the idea here is just take off a lot of the excess grout and polish my lines and identify what kind of condition my grouting is in. Okay, so I can see here I got a little bit of a, I got a hole, I got a little bit of dirt, blah, blah, blah. We're just gonna go through the whole wall here, identify all our little issues. So this project we're doing in two days. So yesterday we did the project from demolition right to tile. Doing that is a disadvantage in the fact that the tile application happened rather quickly. So it wasn't as clean as I would have liked it have to have been. So I've got areas here where I've got dirt sticking out of my grout. We tried earlier to clean it up as best we could, but it's really difficult to be perfect at that point. So now I'm taking my grout remover tool, moving the extra cement from these affected areas. Now we've got our grout set aside, so we're gonna just put it up there. So we're gonna finish just polishing. You can see here, like we talked earlier about using the gray cement, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because I can see where my problems are, but I have to see all the problems I have to fix. <laughs> Well, most professionals um, choose the cheapest product they can find. That's just a reality. So they'll find themselves a wholesaler in the industry who will have map high grout or uh, it's kind of an interesting thing because there's, the science of grout itself is very similar to paint. And the fact that there's a lot of different companies out there that supply it and they all claim to have the best kind of grout for them. But the reality is Everybody has a different kind of dexterity and a different preference when it comes to how they apply, how thick they want it, how they want it to perform. So it's almost a personal choice. Some people like something that dries really fast. Some people like have lots of time to pick around on it. I've seen lots of people, they'll grow with just a little bit on the end. They sit here like this and making sure that everything goes in at a 45 and now they got it perfect. But by the time they're done, They've gone through 30 pounds of grout to do one shower because it dries faster than they can put it on. And you can't just mix a partial bag. If you mix a part of, partial bag of grout, you're running into the same problems you have with a high-speed mixer, where what you might be mixing isn't a proper representation of the color. So when you're mixing grout, you mix it once, you mix more than you need, and you don't go back and make more again. So you got to at least finish the whole wall or a whole room or something like that. So, in answer, all grout is similar. It's not all the same. There are different products available as well. Like, I mean, I can get the same grout here. I can get it with a, um, uh, I can get it so it dries faster. There's a hardener out there. There's some grouts that have a polymer in it that cause it to dry super quick. It's kind of like a, almost like an epoxy the way it dries. <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, there's grout products out there. There's standard grouts that dry almost as fast as an epoxy, but they don't have epoxy principles. 
not as strong. But some guys don't like the way that epoxy cleans, so they won't use it. So they'll use something with a hardener in it. Um, there's grout out there that has a stain sealer in it. You can get grout additives with stain sealers. They're relatively new on the market as far as that's concerned. Really, the only times you need a grout with a hardener is when you're not using a waterproofing system because you want to eliminate the pore stability of the grout. And again, that's just a delaying of the inevitable. If you don't waterproof, you're going to have a problem. It's just a matter of when. And so, for some people, that's fine. If you're just doing your house so that you can sell it, you may not be too concerned about your quality of the product that you're giving somebody. But for me, I just prefer to do it all right the first time. New home construction, for instance, uses the cheapest grout that's on the market. Because the guys that are applying it are getting paid by the square foot. And the warranty is only for one year, so pretty much anything that they put on that wall is going to be fine. One of the reasons why everything is done so poorly in new homes, because of the way that everybody's getting paid. So if you have a builder and you're putting in custom bathrooms, you really need to make sure what products are being used. And you need to realize that chances are you're not going to get the superior quality installation that you're looking for. Remember, a good tile job is in the preparation. The quality is not in what you see in the stone. In a lot of cases, that's the most expensive part, is the stone. Well, why would you put expensive stone over something that's not going to last more than five years? Now, I always buy my, my grout in 10-pound bags. When I'm doing a back, a back splash or a shower, a tile this size, I only need about five. So I have about three pounds of grout left over. But it's easier to mix a large amount than a small amount. And like I said, whatever's left over is no good to me anyway. I can't use it on this site. And there's a lot of colors out there and I generally don't drive around town with bags of empty half bags of empty grout in my car. So. so when you're out shopping for your tile, there's different sizes. Very standard nowadays is a 12 by 24 inch. Um, You'll see them everywhere. There's longer rectangles as well. You do need to be careful when you're picking your tile. A lot of the tiles, the production process leaves them warped. So they have limitations with what designs you can do with them. Uh, for instance, you can get like a six by 36. They'll all be warped. So you can stack them in a row or you can do an offset, like a brick pattern, but you can only do maybe 30% at the most. Every manufacturer will have a different limitation they'll put on their stone. Don't expect too much from it, because the longer the stone, <laughs> the more difficult it is to make sure all the little lines stay flat. Every wall is made of wood and they have curves and bends. So the bigger the stone you use, the less control you have over the environment you're working in. Now you can always buy tile leveling systems. Uh, those are expensive and slow, and they don't always perform as well as you might think, but that's the disadvantages. The advantage is, Grouting is a piece of cake. You can grout a shower with 12 by 24 tile in about 15 minutes, where this takes a whole lot of time. So there's as much grout in this half of this wall as there would be on the entire shower if I used big stone. Now that we're finished with our tile and our polishing, and it needs one more wash, but we can install our finishing trim now for the plumbing. So this is the shower arm. And because this connection is just compression fit and it's inside the wall, I like to go 10 times around with the Teflon tape. And then you just line it up and find the happy place where it threads easy. And you just keep turning it around until it gets nice and stiff. And when you can't go anymore, then you know you've gone deep enough. This takes a little bit of muscle. If you 
gets stuck and it can't get it pointing in the right direction, just shove a screwdriver in the end, get a little extra leverage, and then turn it to the point where you want it. There we go. So shower heads usually come with a gasket inside. So the goal is to get that gasket compressed up against the edge of this metal here. So we just put a little bit of Teflon tape on there. Now we're not using it to seal the plumbing as much as just to lubricate the connection. So whenever you're doing the finishing trim on a tub or a shower or a faucet, always read through the instructions. Generally, there's a lot of similarities one manufacturer to the next, but there's always little in the idiosyncrasies, you know, the unique phases that some places this little piece goes on first, some place it goes on second, blah, blah, blah. You just want to make sure that you're following the right procedure so you don't miss an important connection. This is especially true if you're installing a pressure balance or thermostatic valve. You don't want to get that wrong. Even one little screw in the wrong spot and your system won't work. And you just line up the screws. <laughs> it's usually a little set screw for attaching these. Sometimes it's a screwdriver and sometimes it is an Allen key. Final touch when you're doing your bathroom shower. Surround is you want to silicone all your edges. So anywhere where your tile is meeting another tile surface on an inside corner, tile the tub, tile the ceiling, anywhere where there's going to be uh, changes in the expansion and contraction rate, you want to put a silicone seal. It'll stretch and move with the product so that you don't develop nasty cracks where dirt and grime can collect. So the last step in our shower fixture is to put in our tub spec. Um, and we went with PEX with a drop ear, which is a, a female threaded uh, connection. So we had to get a male thread, which is a brass nipple. And what we're going to do is we're going to thread this in, the same as the shower head. We go about 10 times around. We get this one in the hole here, into our brass nipple. Give it a nice tight. Get it in there nice and tight. And then thread on our tub spoke connection. Pull while you do that. Here we go. Nice and tight. Now the big surprise here is that mom doesn't know that this has happened. And so she's going to be home from her trip soon and it's kind of a gift from her kids to mom. And this is why we've jumped in to help out and make this affordable so that we can renovate the bathroom for her as kind of a, a gift to her for all she's been doing. In two days, we've completely removed and reinstalled a brand new tub and shower system that's waterproof and brand new. And so we can take our time over the next few days now to take care of the floor, vanity, paintwork, that sort of thing. Um, knowing that the homeowners can still live in this house and use the bathroom. At the end of the day, if you're going to do it right, strip it back down to the frame, build it all new, because a project like this Time and materials for everything that we've done is just a little less than 4000 More economical, might take an extra day, but is it really worth it to have the same old junk just hidden behind plastic or to have it all brand new? I'll let you be the judge. <laughs>